Welcome all to this uh, talk with uh, Ed Hafkins and uh, David Kemp, organized by the Blank in occasion of uh, its uh, festival our date that uh, will be held uh, every year in uh, the city of uh, Bergamo. Since now in Italy, the cultural institution uh, has been closed. Uh, we have chosen uh, to convert the festival into a digital uh, version giving a signal of uh, resistance uh, from the world of uh, culture. The exhibition, the act of seeing with one's own eyes, created by Ed Atkins with the work of uh, David Kemp, uh, should be open uh, today. But due to this impossibility, uh, we are pleased to discuss it with uh, Ed Atkins and uh, David Kemp. So Ed and David, thank you uh, to be here and uh, to taking part of this uh, festival. First of all, I would like to ask you about uh, the exhibition, how you conceive it, how you decide uh, to uh, organize it and uh, which are the main topics uh, that uh, you think are relevant. So um, I think for, for a long time, I wanted to uh, add a new naturalistic Foley soundtrack to uh, to an existing silent film. Um, I think this was born of an experience of mine of making animated films and realizing that the point at which you add the sounds to an animated film is the point at which it becomes heavy, the point it becomes sort of physical, or at least fantastically so. You know, it kind of... Um, adds weight to something that was previously weightless. And I suppose thinking about uh, silent films and adding sound to them would be a way to think about um, adding extra weight to them. I mean, I, I mean weight in the most kind of figured way. I mean, like, um, imminence as well. And to a certain extent, a kind of life or, or a contemporaneous kind of sense of life. And, and again, the part of the thinking of that would be thinking about sound as something that um, happens to your body when you hear it, you know, that it vibrates uh, you in certain ways um, and the way that sound waves work. So I suppose, yeah, the, the initial impetus was to, to, to do that, was to add sound to something that was previously silent as a kind of piece of magic um, and looking around for pieces to to do that to Stan Brackage's the act of seeing with one's own eyes became the kind of um, the perfect subject in a way um, because of its subject matter, because of its overt viscerality, but also because of its kind of the kind of silence that it has, you know, because it returns you to thinking about your own body by looking at it very violently, you know, by seeing other bodies um, uh, being autopsied, uh, one is sort of confronted with one's own bodies, and and part of the act of seeing with one's own eyes is is this idea. Sorry about the sound there. Um, is this idea of of apprehending your own eyes materially as well as apprehending your own sense of seeing things? So um, yeah, it, it, I think. I think this idea of uh, sort of emphatically adding sound to this thing was, it just became like the, 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 the perfect place to, to exercise this concept, this kind of uh, pseudo thesis of, 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 of adding sound to something that was always and will forever be silent. The only way to add sound would be to do it uh, fictionally. Um, yeah, that was the beginning of it, really. So the film was a silence uh, film, and uh, Ed, you ask uh, David to add uh, a soundscape uh, to this uh, moving uh, image. So, uh, David, I would like to ask you how you realize uh, the sound, also relating to the idea of the exhibition. Uh, so, uh, when Ed approached me about this uh, this project, I was in the beginning. A bit hesitant if I could actually do it because the the visual material I would work to was so hard to watch. Um, basically, thirty minutes of uh, pretty 
gruel, uh, um, grim uh, operations on dead bodies, basically. So I had to think for a minute if, if I would be able to do it, actually. Um, but then I noticed that there is a way to do it and that I kind of had to do it. I felt like uh, I, I liked the idea so much so that I thought um, I kind of have, have to do this. And then I found ways for me to kind of work efficiently so that I don't have to watch a very uh, horrible shot 20 times, but maybe just two times and proceed to the next one so I can get through. So it was a very intense process uh, working to this footage. But uh, other than that, I approached it like, like you would approach any uh, film where you make Foley, where you record Foley sounds to it. So you look at what you are seeing, you look at the environment um, and you think about how the environment would sound and like the, the background sounds. In this case, there, there would be a lot of ventilation, a lot of cooling devices, fridges, this sort of thing. And then there were the sounds of the people working in the, in the, uh, in the surroundings and um, doing their, their daily job, basically, um, which sometimes was more from the distance, sometimes it was more close up. So I had different types of uh, sounds from, from detailed Foley sounds that I made with, with vegetables things like that. And then um, for, for the very graphic, like um, flashy, let's say, uh, things they were doing. And then also like a, a general presence of people in the place, some, somebody cleaning something in the background, which you could see in some shots. So I tried to basically recreate the, the soundscape, how it would have been if there would have been a, a microphone on the set so to speak, and on the camera, wherever the camera was in the in each shot. So, yeah. I think it's it's important to note there in a way is that there's a kind of, there are two things. One is the sort of fantasy of Foley for me was always, you know, attached to people making the sound of a punch by hitting a cabbage or something. There's a kind of um, Wild West kind of... Uh, Foley or something, or the kind of blockbuster Foley's and stories of how they actually made the sound of like a Chewbacca or something. You know, all of that kind of baggage of a kind of um, cartoonified and fantastical sort of universe. Whereas I think, which is obviously piling in on this thing, which, you know, the act of seeing with one's own eyes is is, is oddly listed as a horror film on IMDb. Um, so it has this sort of weird relationship to genre or the presumption of genre because of the violence that is entailed in it, you know, or also the kind of history of uh, um, video nasties, mondo carne, and, you know, this sort of um, snuff, which is obviously a kind of awful, um, forcible sort of genre making thing. But anyway, that, that kind of feeling of Foley as a sort of Hollywood effect, as a special effect, Whereas actually what David did um, and we talked about was to make it as sort of exquisitely naturalistic as possible. And the volume of, of its playback would be such that it, it, it didn't feel like it was a soundtrack. It wasn't a kind of hysterical version of reality or hyper reality, but was as close as possible to being as kind of banal. And in the same way that the, the, the autopsy the autopsies that are being taken out are being conducted with a kind of banality of procedure, you know, of scientific uh, process, dispassionate, and that actually the sound would kind of mimic or at least match that in some way rather than obviously become this um, excessive cartoonified version, which definitely was on the cards at some point in the conception of this thing, sort of appallingly was the idea of it becoming almost farcical in its relationship to to special effects in some way in in mm -hmm. sound you know i think um it it turned out actually to be a lot of, about the the balance between those background sounds that i mentioned yeah. um and the actual very hyper real close up 
detailed sounds of of the things they were doing because if if i lowered the basically the level of the environment um it's it becomes this really not 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 any more realistic representation mm. of the space mm. so so i think dialing in this uh this level between the the detailed foley stuff and the background stuff was pretty important so in in the version that we ended up with there's actually um a lot of a lot of background sounds that make you feel like you're in this environment and then if mm. you listen closely you can within it you can hear the gory details but it's not in your face so much and you yeah um there are a few moments like a, a very loud brain saw a bone saw brain saw would have been possible as well but it was a <laughs> bone saw um which was just obviously very close up very loud but some of the other stuff kind of creeps through the the background and is is mixed pretty low um I think which made it which made it even more horrible sometimes i think yeah and that 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 sense of you know at least as a listener and a viewer the thing that kind of corroborates the real in this thing is often noise rather than sound in a way so the kind of hum of the of the air conditioning and things which are you know bad sounds in as much as they are kind of um you know, obviously in a studio or if you're recording outside, you wait for the aeroplane to go past or something. Whereas this sort of bed of noise, which is just the sound of the room, is the thing that kind of authenticates it as, or at least pretends to authenticate it as real in some way, I think. So uh, we are describing this uh, imaginary exhibition in a way, and uh, that uh, it uh, will be divided in two parts. One with the film of uh, Stumble Cage and the other part with uh, the uh, audio of uh, David Kemp. I was curious uh, to know about your interest in a uh, Stumble Cage film, uh, since uh, you describe it as uh, ugly and in a sort of way also as like a horror film. So what's your interest in this artist and uh, particularly in this artwork? I mean, uh, I should say that I've never fully seen the film. I find it um, impossible uh, for me, which uh, I don't, you know, I don't see as a kind of cowardice, but as a kind of individual, you know, because it, it it demands your own relationship to your body and to those things to be to come to the fore. And for whatever reason, I find it very difficult to watch. Not for whatever reason, for very obvious reasons. I think a lot of people would find it very difficult to watch. Some people find it not so difficult, you know. But I, I think. Um, I think, you know, just to go back again, is exactly my interest in the thing was was born one of the interest in adding sound to a silent film, but also um, in my own work, there is a kind of constant, persistent, at least, um, um, relationship to the body's representations or the more abject aspects of bodily experience, um, or my body particularly, my body's abject experiences in some way and, and what happens to those experiences when they are re represented via whatever um, mediating thing, you know, whether that is a camera, or whether that's a computer generated thing. Um, so the Brackage film has, uh, has sort of been part of a, um, a, a, a kind of um, suite of references for me for a long time. Um, I think uh, I think in terms of the way that we we chose to install them separately, as in the the original film, sixteen mil projection on one side and on the other side, David's um, you know perfectly synchronized uh, simultaneous sound, but you could never experience them together. Was again a way to uh, two things. One was to uh, to respect. Uh, Stan Brackage's work and his choice or or lack thereof or whatever to 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 have any sound to have diegetic sound of any kind um, and also the kind of air of, of of the sacred that I think is conjured around that work because the the thing of watching bodies being processed is a kind of sacrilege there is a kind of heresy to that the feeling of 
seeing something you're not supposed to see. And I think the silence in the in in his work, or the, just the sound, the whir of the 16 mil projector or whatever, is a kind of um, is the kind of sound that silences everyone around it. I feel like if there were sound in the room, people might feel at liberty to talk. So there's the respect to Stan Brakhage's piece, but there's also this sense that um, it's the it's the viewer themselves that is going to sort of suture the two sides of the exhibition together. They become the the glue that binds the two sides. So as someone moves from watching the the film to listening to the soundtrack, knowing that it is absolutely simultaneous to the visual, that they they have to kind of you know the the combination of the two sides only happens in the viewer listener you know that there is this kind of demand on them to 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 be to pull it together and therefore their body is kind of um very literally implicated in the whole process they are the conjoining force so i think um i think for me it was it, it was a you know, like with a lot of things, it's a kind of practical limit which becomes a conceptual necessity in some way that you have to deal with and think about. And I, I never wanted to upset those people that would, and me, myself included, would want to respect Stan Brakhage's, you know, towering achievement of making this work and his own experience of doing so. You know, I just, I, I wanted to, in as much as the exhibition is a conceptual work, I wanted that to have to necessarily happen inside the imagination and the body of the, the viewer. Yeah, and I think also the the moment when because people were were able to switch between the different rooms, like going from the sound room to the image room and back again. And once they did that a few times or multiple times, they had an idea of the sound and I I haven't spoken to to the audience about that how how they feel, but I can imagine that once you saw the picture, you perceive the the sound room differently because you know what it's referencing basically, and the other way around. Um, so I think this this having this memory of the the other half, let's say, yeah. um, c could be really interesting. But yeah. I think it's I think it's also this idea that um, by adding this soundtrack or by positing the addition of this soundtrack, you kind of conjure the idea that the original was absent something. You know, when obviously when you see the original, it's it, you don't you don't think that there there was sound that was taken away. You know, so it adds this kind of strange absence that then is is so it. Basically, the sound being added creates the absence that it then fills in some way, and then vice versa. So being in the room with just the sound, you're very aware that you're missing what what is this attached to? what are you what is this the sound of? And then in the other room, because of the the new soundtrack, which kind of um, invents reinvents history in some way, um, you you want to know what it sounds like. You need this affirmed or 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 made physical in some way by the sound so i think they they, they become this sort of seesaw to, i just thought that kind of absence was sort of important i was just thinking about it anyway carry on sorry so the stan uh, breakage film was uh, filmed uh, in uh, 1971 so almost uh, 50 years already passed and uh, i think that in this time the concept uh, of the body, but also the concept of the death change uh, a lot. So I would like to ask you what your uh, idea of, uh, of the death of the body and how you think uh, it changed in these uh, 50 years and how the public who see this movie for the first time 50 years ago could uh, approach it uh, now. Shall I go for that one? Yeah, if you want, yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it's it's almost impossible to to know, but I would say that things nowadays, the representations of death, I think there is this kind of, you know, particularly over the last 50 years, there's a huge amount of time. I think the kind of mimetic representation of death um, is both more proximate and far more distant. I think that the 
kind of mediation of the reality of death, its representation through greater and greater fidelity, but greater and greater fiction. I don't know. I think I think that it's. I mean, I think it's an eternal piece of work. I don't. I think it might just leapfrog over a lot of the the problems of representation, which is part of its sort of its singular capacity is to get to this eternal kind of nub of the act of seeing with one's own eyes. I think that, it, that I, there's nothing you could do to improve or update that imagery. I don't think, you know, to in order to sort of speak better to a contemporary audience, I, I suppose, I suppose uh, there are lots of aspects in its production which would have to be different and probably couldn't happen now in terms of we don't know who those bodies belong to are you know there is no there is no responsibility in their representation or their quote unquote desecration or whatever or their processing so there are lots of um there are lots of pro aspects of, of that um i think the kind of weird um allowance that was given to Stan Brackage to go in there and film is unthinkable now. But in terms of an audience's response to it, I I feel I feel like it it's something that spans history, that audiences then would respond similarly as they do now, I think, with a kind of uncontrollable thing. It's not a conscious decision. It's a very prime prim, primal response. <clears throat> that one has to it. I think that obviously it's eternally relevant as well. Is yeah. How we deal with death, how we hide from death or how we process death. You know, all of these things are um, uh, always, always important, I think, to think about and always often rather hidden from view. I think that Death is something that we sprint away from. And I think um, this kind of confrontation with it, which has its problems totally in terms of its aestheticization of death, you know, unavoidably, it's also a very beautiful film in as much as the 16 mil film stock is gorgeous. You know, there are moments of exquisite sort of calm and, and almost like um, still life beauty. Um, I don't know. I think it, I think it's one of those works that sort of, plugs into every aspect of representation, of art, but also of um, what it is to, to be alive. So, yeah. yeah. I, I also think there's, there's an element, um, you, you sort of hinted at it, um, that, is, that will be the same for an audience from the 70s and for an audience today, because there's rarely a, a chance or, or a, a moment for people to to see these things if they aren't working there or they are let's say doctors that see very badly injured people or something like that so i think this seeing it and also seeing it in this length i mean it's it's 30 minutes it's not like you're seeing mm. a, a one minute shot of something and then you go back to to like maybe in a thriller film or something where you see this one gory moment and then you know um and also just knowing that everything is real that that this is all not um makeup and ketchup and whatever they they use on on mm. film sets um i think um regarding the audience it also may, maybe one difference between the 17s, uh, 70s and now is that especially some of the of the younger people i guess um that grew up with computer games things like that might have seen more violent things being done to to human bodies um than the generations that that were grown ups or, or teenagers in the 70s because i think in, in some games, for example, you see very um, gory things, and and the younger people today have seen more of that probably than than in the seventies. But that's just um, just a theory. I don't know. 
I think it's also, though, it speaks in a way to the fact that I think that the footage um, is so immediately, obviously real. Yeah. You know, that there's something about it. It's a bit, uh, uh, you know, as someone that has, uh, as most people have, has seen a person die or, 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 or have been with a dead body, the absolute, um, you know, f finality of that, the immobility of, you know, the fact that it's, there is no dubious, there is no doubt in the encounter there. And I think that the film captures that. I think there is this kind of um, absolutely sort of ancient response that a body has to seeing that, that is wildly other than watching a slasher film or a, or a, or anything is a kind of uh, um, a complete um, understanding immediately. Immediately you are aware that this is death that you're looking at. And I think, um, I, I agree with David that that, uh, that certainly the, there's the potential for a kind of generational desensitization to the representation of death. But I think that 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 the thing that is not the representation, but which is actually the thing, which is obviously being represented through the camera and the film and all of that stuff. But the thing in itself, the, the subject is is um, uh, it is. Uh, undoubtedly the real thing, I think. Yeah. So last uh, question of uh, this talk. Uh, let me say that uh, both of you as artists uh, worked with uh, digital uh, technologies. And uh, now in this uh, pandemic situation, we are going uh, through uh, like a, a digital world or a virtual world. So I'm curious to know your opinion about uh, the future situation how you think uh, digital technology could help or not, and uh, what's your perspective for this future? Go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, for me, it's um, it's actually I have been less affected by by the whole thing than than many other um, visual artists or, or people with a lot of exhibitions because. Um, I also do a lot of uh, work in film and especially a lot of work in animation. So a lot of animation uh, projects are actually still happening and I'm able to to basically work as before because I have, have been working remotely with um, filmmakers from from anywhere in the world for years now. So I'm kind of used to this. It's not like I'm thrown in a, into a crazy situation that I had never worked within. And it's entirely different if, if I had like a lot of shows that are all uh, being canceled now. I, I have the occasional show, but it's not, it's, it's not um, uh, like my main, um, my main work, let's say. There's, uh, there's a few exhibitions, but I've been pretty lucky that they kind of happened uh, in in moments where they were still open, still were able to open in, in a smaller way, at least. The, the first one that's actually completely cancelled in, in a f physical way is this one for me. But I think uh, Ed has, has had some way worse uh, experiences there, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, everything is cancelled. Um... I mean, in terms of exhibitions, I suppose, or just delayed indefinitely. I mean, I think, uh, in a way, like David, I think uh, there's a, there was a potential throughout all of this for me to practically, you know, get on because a lot of my work is on the computer. I think the reality though is uh, I've been profoundly unproductive, and I found it very difficult to make work for a void. You know, uh, even if even on, on the most optimistic day of thinking about the return of a horizon in, in the future or something, I think, uh, I think like a lot of people, I just, uh, I, I think it's very different if, you know, I think basically the idea of coming up with stuff, um, anything more than uh, the, the, the sort of miniature work I found really difficult and really what's not, what's the point, but just a kind of, 
this isn't the point, right? I think art, art's been difficult, you know. I think, I think, I think it's been very difficult to, and I don't mean that in a kind of like a woeful way. I just mean like art's role is 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 sort of cast into a precarious spot by you know real world stuff. Having said that, uh, it's also been a, a real sanctuary to 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 engage with art and to think about it um, because, but particularly stuff you know luxuriantly stuff that is is not directly or didactically related to what's happening in the world. I suppose um, I don't. I I have lost all uh, attempt to kind of like well in a month's time it'll probably get better or something. I mean. I think this is the new thing, doing this. Um, I think it's really, it's really sad that your project particularly has been cancelled. I think it, you know that's been a, re a really, a big, a big wake up call in a way because some of the other things that have been cancelled for me have been, um, you know, punted further and further afield until they sort of just disappear or something. I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's nothing, no sort of clever little bit to say at the end of that. This is like a sentence that should just go on for 10 years. We will, we will try to stay positive and uh, we hope to have occasion <laughs> to do something physically and uh, together. <laughs> and uh, and surely we, we will never give up. But I mean, no. It's, it's for our. And. Uh, so guys, I really, I really want to to thank you for uh, for this talk and all for thank you. For consideration. Thank you. And uh, so we we really look forward to welcoming you in Bergamo <laughs> in the future. <laughs> we also look we'll be there somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so thank much. You. Uh, thanks, thanks to you a lot, really, from uh, for all the the blank and uh, all the people involved in the in the festival. And, uh, and also thanks to the public who will uh, see this uh, video. So, mm. bye cool. guys. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.